So, I did the chicken. My name is Daniel. I'm gonna be coming up with the Watershed Project. And at the Watershed Project, we focus solely on invasive plants. But before I get into the invasive plants and talking about what we're doing specifically in Cordova, I wanted to give you an overview of invasive species in general so you understand the context of why they're so harmful and why we're putting so much effort into eradicating them. So, what invasive species are, how they're transported, what their impacts are, and how we can stop them and, and what we're doing in Cordova. Specifically, and then what you can do to help stop the thing. So an invasive species, by definition, is an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And this is the broadly accepted definition in the United States that was coined in the executive order 13192, which was signed in 1999 by President Clinton. And an important distinction of the term invasive species is that it implies that harm is going to be done to the environment or economically. So you'll see species being defined as alien or non-native or exotic or introduced and all of those terms are synonymous with saying that a species is not natural to the area that it's invading, but only invasive implies that it's causing harm. And there are plenty of non-native species that are not invasive and not causing harm. They're just not native to the area that they're in. And the honeybee is a great example of that because we actually benefit greatly from the honeybee being here and pollinating, but it's not native to the United States. One example. So invasive species are transported a lot of different ways on a global scale. These are the probably the largest examples of that. And each one of these transport methods is called a vector. So found is a big one, and that's usually associated with the hauls of ships. This is a picture of a colleague of mine doing a violet cell for survey of a buoy in Valley Farm last summer just sampling, going to see what kind of invertebrates were on the buoy. And you didn't find anything invasive, thank you. Um, aquaculture is another big one. Uh, fish escaping from pens. The pet trade, either from the act of transport of pets from point A to point B, they escape along the route, or people don't like the pets anymore that they get, and then they release them out into the wild because they don't feel comfortable euthanizing them or they don't feel like they're going to pet store and, and dispose of them that way. Same goes for aquariums. There's fish who go to the pen so they just don't want them anymore and they just put it out in their local pond or stream and then someone else does the same thing and they breed and there's just some fish in there. Um, fishing gear is a big one. Kind of goes along with found. Anything grows in your nets or your lines and you transport it to home fish for another and you can transport those species. Um, ornamental flowers is a, a really big one in Alaska and especially in Cordova because a lot of invasive plant species are beautiful. So people want to plant them in their yards and their gardens and it's not a good idea because they're invasive, but they don't know or you just want them because they look nice. Um, marine debris is one, is a vector that gained a lot of attention after the Japanese tsunami. So all that um, debris that was lost in the Western Pacific Ocean is following the Great Circle Route and it's just landing on all of Alaska's coastline, especially in the winter months. Um, ballast water is a huge vector, it's probably a big one, um, but uh, the vector for the transport of marine invasive species. Seed mixes, um, anything containing seed mix unless you see on the bag that it's certified as being solely for a specific area. So you might find um, grass mixes, grass mixes that are specific to Alaska or potting soil that's specific to an area. Otherwise, they can, you know, can have any sort of possibility in it. Um, heavy equipment or road equipment is, is another large one because um, 
plant bits or copy ghost that stuck in the shreds of tire so you can make links for from one to another or to get cut spot on the blade of um, cutting equipment. And flame. Um, two reasons. In Alaska, the big one is heat is um, slope planning, transporting um, weather from the ski from one lake to another. And then on carbon, the other big thing they caught was ashes that were cut very thinly and transported to build lanes. So, on a global scale, these are just some examples of invasive species around the world that have caused really, have really, really large impacts. We start with the red king crab, which is very popular and important to Alaska and the Bering Sea, but a couple decades ago, some Russians thought it would be a good idea to transplant them from the eastern side of Russia to the western side of the Barents Sea, and they, they transported juveniles and some other invasive plants across. Um, the cone jelly was introduced to the Black Sea in the 1980s from ballast water, and it just decimated an entire ecosystem in the Black Sea and has had extremely strong economic impacts in that area. It's an uh, invertebrate. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have a picture. It, it has like eight or six cones. Um, it's not, it's not in the same family as a jellyfish, but it kind of has that same structure. Some things are really tiny and some things are much bigger. Yeah, they have big ones in there. <laughs> but, uh, not good for plastic. Um, the Northern Pacific Sea Star is native to the coast of Japan and China and even up into Alaska, but it was carried to Australia and New Zealand in ballast water, and it um, had some negative economic impacts to the shellfish fisheries in that region, and it really um, took over all the native, native marine species in that area. Um, the crayfish was introduced to Africa um, a couple decades ago, and it's as far as I know, there are no native crayfish to Africa, so the concern is that it's, it's preying on and replacing all the um, native aquatic species there. And they're afraid that it's going to spread into the larger ocean, but it, it's not controlled to. And the lionfish, which is native to the Indo-Pacific, was transported to the Caribbean and Florida and was even put up into Georgia. Um, I think it was first seen in the 90s, and um, it's pretty bad. It's, it's a beautiful fish, but it's a voracious predator. It will eat anything in its path, and it reproduces very quickly. So it's just, it's just, it, it just expanded. I was in um, Bermuda this summer doing some fouling work. Oh, is that a cone jelly? Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah. But um, in Bermuda, the lionfish has kind of become this celebrity, and in the Caribbean, because they're just so beautiful, but they've actually started um, kind of hunting competitions for them, where you can go and catch as many lionfish as you can, and the restaurants will cook them for you and eat them just to try to get the public involved in getting rid of them, which is silly. Um, they're just really bad. Um, Scaling it down a little bit to the United States. In Florida, the Burmese python is very invasive, mostly because people have them as pets because they think they're cool and then they either get tired of them or they escape from their cages and then it's a really big problem. Um, Asian carp, they were actually intentionally introduced in the United States in the 70s to help filter water and um, there's kind of a debate on how they escaped, but the thought is that they were flooding and, and they escaped that way. And now they're, they're everywhere in the Mississippi River and around the world. And Is that a different thing in Mississippi? I think so. Um, but there's pretty strong efforts going on to keep them out of the river. So they have sort of electric barriers kind of across the river so that they don't spread into the lake. Does that impact other native fish in that area? 
don't know how much yeah. how much I would imagine so if they're going up the river yeah. there is a fish. I'm not sure. I would wanna bring it up and try to see the real thing. Um but there are al- also competitions that you can catch as well. Um and in the Great Lakes the zebra mussel was introduced to the Valley of Florida and that has had a huge economic impact. It's kind of the poster child for invasive species, at least in the United States. Really detrimental to wild um water quality and it has problems it causes problems uh, with insect bites and utility companies. It just causes them to shut down whole co- their whole um, facilities and they're unable to fight the invaders and it's really dangerous. There's a lot of indirect costs to that. Um, Canada thistle is a plant that's pretty widespread in the western United States, but it's also in Alaska. Um, the snow flake coral in Hawaii is native to the Caribbean, but it was brought to Hawaii probably through via Fallon and it's the soft coral, you know, hard coral, yeah. soft coral that spread pretty widely. And in Canada, in the Pacific Northwest, <coughs> they have, um, their concern is A, that they will escape and put them up to um, native Pacific corn stalks, and also the waste and the debris that forms from their plants. So this is just a, the very tip of the iceberg. There was an estimate in 2005 done um, that there's over 50,000 invasive species just in the United States alone. So <laughs> it's just a small, small sample. This is to show you. Yeah, and we're not sure mm-hmm. if we're going to land on that map, but we we know it's like a it's like a widespread river. Oh, I don't know actually. I have to look that up and look Maybe we'll take an extra helicopter yeah. or a jet to yeah. the one over by Wyoming with the continental divide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we can get the ocean view. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That does not look like something from the water table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it in the Python population? I don't know. Uh, so so pythons are not poisonous. Yeah. They yeah. are yeah. a constrictor. Oh, yeah. So oh, they get worried about people who like them as pets. And one time had like his his daughter woke up in the middle of the night and the python had wrapped itself around her. And somehow got it off of her and that was too late. That was just terrible. But anyway, they oh. Yeah, they set it free. What's that? Can you set it free? Yeah, yeah probably. probably. <laughs> wow, that's how it happened. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a story in the news not too long ago about two young girls who were just uh, were killed by a um, sea python that was fairly close to them. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I'm Poppy, it is Arthur and Corona, and it's only the Earth there. That's one of those really beautiful plants that people are um, still playing around. Um, it was, I think someone took it out to their cabin and they put it at National Wildlife Refuge and it spread from there and it can really reduce the forage volume for native um, animals in the area. Pick one <laughs> and battle that. Um, and the Norway rat. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of money was spent to eradicate the rat off of Rat Island in the ocean. And it has been eradicated. Um, it preys or preyed on native birds. You know, the ocean's a really big stopover point for migratory birds. And so they wanted to eradicate that. It was probably got there from ships. Um, and I know there's some sort of union with that island, mm -hmm. so it no longer has that. Okay, and then locally, most of the, well, I should say all the vacant land near Keats, or Poppy, there's been a, a lot of yards at Bowser Airport, it's all been really good fishing men. Um, visitors are not really just been fishing in the Norway. Um, wireweed, there's two species of Elodia. Um, we're not entirely sure which species is in the Lake Yap, because it's I believe the far service is going to be some genetic sort this winter to find out. But either way, it's invasive and it, it has the same effect. Um, the canary grass is these are some examples of some really iconic, like Four Mile. It's noticeably out to one at a time, but it's really like a very long white tail that. Yeah, it's a lot of species. Um, white sweet clover was found once at Mount Eccles, which is cool, um, but it has since been eradicated, or reported to be eradicated, so that's good. Hopefully it stays there, but we'll be checking up on that location real soon. It's funny because I, it, we've been doing all this work up in the basin and I haven't seen it up in the basin, but then it was maybe doing a news round and somebody sent me a picture and then two days later, I was walking someplace across the lake, and I was like, that's it. <laughs> that's the one in the picture. <laughs> and they had just done all that replanting because they mm -hmm. uh, renovated the bridge pool. So maybe it could be doing that. But anyway, they thought, oh, maybe it's from a new bridge. I'm sure that some of it came from out of town. Yeah, absolutely. But it was just one stalk, and then, wow. Good. And some other things. It was just kind of funny to look that up. But we have pictures. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Butter and egg. It's been alive for these yards. It's like a very similar. It's also the for yellow fish that Bowser Island has been finding there. Um, ornamental jewelry, jewelweed, creeping bell flower, in people's yards. Um, oxide daisy is another one that's been alive for these years. And my favorite, black shrub. Um, it is an article for the biology, but the ubiquitous. <laughs> Um, and not much has been done been done to it, but maybe. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say that when I walked my dog. I think I was just going to say uh, greenery is a great flower. Good. Yeah. So in the last few years, I have been kind of not paying such a close attention to the plant flora and little description of the Oh, 
Um, but the feds do still count for the most for some reason. And the US for uh money contributed. But the non profits that are run by the United States government are not. Mhm. And the non profits that are regulated are not. Mhm. Yep. Um This is a breakdown of what that money was spent on. Um seventy nine percent of it was for our shrill. We were planning for animals. Twelve percent of fresh water fish. Probably a lot of that is for the tides and the marine life conservancy stuff. Eight percent on marine. Twenty percent on animals, and then it's small stuff on uh fresh water fish. And lastly, looking at economic impact, um this is a breakdown of particular species that can benefit from it. So it's five million dollars spent on bringing these out on our island. Um about three million on the northern pike. One point four on white sweet clover and knotweed and reef marygrass. Those are all three species that are known to love us. Um point eight on rabbit. And point seven on the European green crab. And note that that money spent on the green crab was all for benefiting our modern day marine mammals. The green crab is not being protected in the West Coast. But they're putting in a lot of effort to monitor for it in southeast because it is in British Columbia, and it could have pretty strong impacts on on fisheries in southeast. We actually have a green crab monitoring program here in the port of Hope that the Coast Marine Sonar is involved with. Yeah, that's great. I did I think I saw some pictures of of someone putting out flaps that looked like it was like Yeah, Sarah Hefner is the primary human interest there on that project. Yeah. And it's sponsored by the Jim Jones Center, I believe. Okay. Yep. Excellent. It's the only government one. Correct. It's the tourism one. It's not the marine one. Yeah. I think the green crab is just on our last rail and we're just gonna have to make do with what we can use. So it's like pretty pretty bad news. Um From a biological standpoint, there's some general characteristics that all this species have. Two of which are that they replace native species and that they increase the vulnerability and susceptibility of an area to further invasion. Specifically, they form monocultures. Reef marygrass does this, European sweet grass in the western United States does this. Um they just form these dense mats and they replace everything that's in their path. They reduce biodiversity. Um Kathy talked about that on on Kodiak, they reduce their forage value. Um they have more native animals. They alter the ecosystem structure. So the purple leaf sedge is a good example of that, um because it really alters wetlands and wetland habitat. And purple leaf sedge is in forty eight states, including Alaska, and I think the United States spends about forty five million dollars a year just controlling it. And it is on Alaska's prohibited not to feed list. So don't be an endangered species. Uh they change habitat. The zebra mussel reduces oxygen availability in the Great Lakes and it's just has that really strong um sound impact because it's still an energy use path. And lastly, um they can deplete food sources. So they actually are depleting food sources within their food web, within their envir- within their um ecosystem. Are also depleting commercial food sources for for people. So the green crab has had impacts on the shellfish fisheries in New England. Um and from a social standpoint, this species alter aesthetics, they impact recreation and tourism. They can impact subsistence species, which is pretty important in Alaska. They still depend a lot on subsistence lifestyles. Um they can impact health, pest control, a lot of money is put annually into pest control. A good example of that is um the red fire ants in the south in Texas. Um it's just they have poisoning from it because of the fuel and the way it's harmful. So a lot of money goes into eradicating that. 
um, water quality supplies, agriculture, and commercial fisheries. They're all suffering. Um, any kind of uh, concerns from an economic, biological, and social standpoint, they're all trying to name it. So this first picture here says marine debris. I don't know what that is. I guess that's what they're going to coin marine debris. The second one is the Lodia plot in the top um, PNI. And they're over there. And the last one is the um, some work that we did in a top of the basin just a few weeks ago in a weed smackdown. And um, we'll work through closing that area. So. so we are doing a lot. There are a lot of efforts in place to control these species. There's legislation at the international, national, state, and local levels to control them. In the United States, there's uh, the National Invasive Species Act of 1996. There's the executive order we talked about, I think, from 99. Um, there's the Plant Protection Act. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has programs in place to stop plants and animals from being introduced into the country. Um, the Lacey Act, which is from the 1900s, is now being used to make it a federal offense to transport certain species. Um, so one, one of them being Ruby Nectar. Um, extinction's a big one. Um, there's so many generations and just get the word out to people about invasive species and the harms that they cause. Physical control can include anything from manually removing a species um, plants, cutting off seed heads, carping, mowing, cutting, um, create, putting up physical barriers to restrict them from advancing. This is an example of carping in Odiak Pond, so it goes from Ruth to Mary Bay. Um, biological controls are... <laughs> um, I guess I should say proceed with caution with biological controls because often what ends up happening is you introduce a known predator or a parasite to control an invasive species. It sounds like a good idea, but often doesn't go as planned. So what ends up happening is you replace one invasive species with another or you double the problem. So the bee disease. Yes. Yes. I just have one. What in Australia? Yeah, similar to that. I mean, it's a little bit easier, but one of, I guess one of my family, or there's something that, yeah, makes them like, there's no way they can even understand what they're fighting about if I just have the code copy. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, the same thing happened in Guam. They insisted that there was one, and they introduced another, and that didn't work. They introduced another, and that the one that they introduced first, and that didn't work. And it's just, it just keeps escalating. And it, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of thought into, in, before you should introduce another species into an area where you already have an ecological disturbance. And um, yeah, proceed with caution. Um, but one example where it does work is goats. So this picture is from a farm on the east coast of Virginia where they had an invasive weed problem and they used to build like a goat farm around it. And the goats were eating the invasive so chemical efforts include just herbicides and pesticides, getting the nitrogen needed, and rehabilitation. So after you remove an invasive species, it's important to reintroduce or revegetate that area with newer species. So that's something that the Watershed Project is doing. Um, we built a native plant garden between the hospital and Odiak Pond, and there's there's four different beds for different purposes, but the back bed um, has native grasses in it so that they'll produce food so that we have native food on hand when we remove parts so that the roots can have grass so that we can plant native grasses in there. What else do you have in here? That might help. Uh, blue joint. Which one is this? Um, there's some native sedges. I don't remember off the top of my head. I have a list, but I can't remember off the top of my head. 
So that's fun. Now we just need some plants to plant black beans. Put them in. Yep, put them in some blue beans. And, um, but the tarping, I didn't show this earlier, I meant to. The tarping on these canary grass seems to stay in place for about three or four growing seasons. So we'll do that for a couple of years before we move out here where we really have to care for them. So picking gears a little bit to look more specifically at Alaska. Um, UAA, the Alaska and the Alaska Natural Heritage Program created a statewide tracking database for all non-native plants and it's called the Alaska Exotic Plant Information Sharing Elf and it's publicly available online and anyone can use it, anyone can contribute to it and it just tracks the location and the infestation area of all non-native plants. You can see in this picture that they're most prolific in highly populated areas in Anchorage, Southeast, South Central, all along the rail belt. And then if you zoom into Cordova, they're all along the top of the highway. And that's probably twofold. One, because that's where people are, so that's where the action is, that's where the plants are being spread to. Um, but also because that's where all the people are, so that's where all the effort is being put into looking for them. So in Alaska, there's several different groups that are focused on invasive species and invasive plants in particular. The, country, the Soil and Water Conservation District has took the lead on a lot of it, um, but because we, don't, we have a district here in Cordova, that's where the watershed project comes in. Um, there's the Alaska Committee for Noxious Invasive Plant Management, and they meet monthly by teleconference and they do a lot of um, forest sharing information and management efforts and control efforts. There's the Alaska Invasive Species Working Group, which focuses on plants in, well focuses on really all parts of the ecosystem, such as aquatic. And then there's an annual Invasive Species Conference, which changes location each year. Last year was in Port Jackson for the 10th year event. Generally, the same sort of uh, group of people usually, but they share updates and their efforts in each past year. So when does that happen? November fifth through the seventh this year in Fairbanks, and I'm going to go um, and present some work on ballast water and marine invasives, and also present some work on the help of the watershed project work on invasive plants. Get the word out there about what we're doing here in Fairbanks. Um, there's about 400 invasive plant species in Alaska, according to the Ask Epic database, and they're commonly found in those highly populated areas, so along roadsides, at trailheads, in people's backyards and gardens, um, and any disturbed sites. So this is a picture of Elodia that I took two weekends ago, and it was, it was like really nice weekend, and I was out for a run, and along Lake Eyak, there was this huge mass of Elodia that just walked its way up. So just think of that. It doesn't go to burn now, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's lots left in the lake. And lastly, on invasive plants in Alaska are cooperative weed management areas, which are known as CWMAs. And <coughs> They're established in Anchorage, Fairbanks, Lake Kenai, and Kodiak. Um, Juno used to have one, I'm not sure how active they are anymore, in the Copper Basin and now in Cordova. So I'll describe to you what a cooperative weed management area is. Um, a CWMA is a geographic zone in which as many businesses and agencies and services within the area coordinate to combat invasive weeds. So in Cordova, our CWMA includes cities and then to the extent of our road system. Um, and there's about 40 species of non-native plants in Cordova. 
we are targeting eight senators on a ranking provided by the Applicant Ethics Database in VA 100. So we've chosen um, our target species based on that ranking and based on the prevalence in the area. Um, within the Cedar Dome area plan, we've identified four goals, <coughs> the first of which is to prevent introduction of new plants. So by getting the word out and, and educating and talking to people on native plants, we can follow good practices in um, not bringing native species into town in the first place. The second is to contain, control, or eradicate high priority species. Third, to promote awareness of invasive plants. And lastly, to facilitate cooperation or control efforts. So to do that, We've been reaching out to a lot of partners in town, anyone who ha would have an interest in combating invasive weeds, which would be everyone. Um, so this is our list of partners. And we've contacted everyone on this list so far, and everyone's been really supportive. So that includes uh, the Champagne, the Forest Service, Eagle and Wilson, um, the Medical Center, the Science Center, um, the city, the native village of EAC, the utility company, um, I think that's everyone. And it's, it's really everyone's interest because there's multiple landowners in town and it's, an, it's a special election. So try to incorporate everyone <coughs> in our efforts, including homeowners and landowners. So lastly, here are some things that all three of you can do, or five of you can do. <laughs> um, one is to clean off yourself and your pets after you go hiking. So either when you come down off the trail or before you go home or get in your vehicle and go somewhere else, just brush off your jacket so it's in it, so your boots, your dog, or your waders, <coughs> just to remove those things and keep them from spreading. Um, clean off your ATVs and your boats, trailers, trucks, anything that you're transporting from point A to point B that could um, you know, have easily baked off the gills or plant parts to attach to it. Report invasive weed sighting to the Waterford Project. Even if you're unsure, we can come out and properly identify it for you and then help you with the eradication efforts. Don't release your exotic pets or stray fish into the wild. Uh, and be aware about what you're planting in your garden. It can be really easy to go to anchors and see something that looks nice and buy it and put it in there, but not necessarily a good ecological decision. And then sometimes too, the, uh, I suppose more so the big box stores and some of the specialty garden places, but uh, they can sell seed mixes that might have mm. stuff in there. I think that's somebody told me that the Home Depot or Lowe's, I can't remember which, and some place was selling a seed mix that had orange blossoms in it. Mm. So so be careful about that too. Have you contacted the local uh, store? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Yeah. You should talk to my friend for that. Because Joe yeah. has a big box of stuff. Yeah. 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 But that the Lowe's or Home Depot, the age here was really mm -hmm. up. group that gets together once a month it'd be interesting to, to raise it that way and I don't know if they've already done something or not but if they haven't maybe as a group mm -hmm. those folks could go to yeah Home Depot and Lowe's and yeah. 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 yeah don't pack exotic food susceptible plants or animals when you're traveling so there's a lot of reasons why you throw out those forms when you're traveling internationally or when you travel to Hawaii to say what you're, to declare what you're uh, transporting. So one of those reasons is that so you're not bringing in an invasive, invasive or harmful um, species into the area. What about like throwing apple cores or peach pits mm -hmm. out the window? Thank you. 
clear of the environmental impact of those trees. Yeah. And granted, we're probably not going to be growing peach trees in this climate. That's what I was thinking. Like Bethany. Yeah. It's true. Bethany. Yeah. 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 Yeah.